I'm Christian. I work as a sort of kernel engineer as a, at Canonical. Um, do a lot of upstream work, maintain a few bits and pieces in the upstream kernel. Um, and originally, I wanted to, was supposed to give a talk about writing a kernel driver in Rust, which is still work we are doing, uh, actually. But I got bronchitis, so you get PIDFDs. Uh, I don't know if it's a fair trade, but for everybody, we're on the same page. Uh, this is PIDFDs, not Rust, in this case. Um, right. Um, and we can do this in different ways. I usually, I, I, I don't mind taking questions during my talk. So um, if you have a pressing, pressing issue, just ask right away. Okay. Um, whatever switches to the next slide. Right. So pit of D's, what is that? Um, I guess is the first question. I mean, who has heard about this work in the first place? Ah, okay. So LWN did a good job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the basic idea, it's a, it's a file descriptor that uh, refers to a process, which is not a new idea, and, and I'm going to uh, get to this bit, uh, uh, in, to this piece in a little bit. Um, but specifically, the way we did it for the initial implementation uh, is that it's an ID which refers to a threat group leader. So right now you cannot have a pit of D that refers to a single uh, threat just because we didn't have uh, we didn't have a use case for it. It's not necessarily out of scope. It's something we could think about, but it probably requires a lot more thinking about uh, about this semantics that we would need. And the idea is that a, a pit of D serves as a sort of stable and private handle. Um, that guarantees you it will always refer to the same process. Um, so, and it abuses something uh, in the kernel that has been existed, has existed for a long time, which is the kernel's version of a stable handle on, on a process, uh, which is struct pit. Uh, and note, uh, this uses, uh, yeah, we use struct pit, not task struct, right? For the kernel, actually, it, thread if you want to put it like this. A task uh, is identified by a task struct. You could also argue that uh, we could have made a pit of D refer to, uh, to a task struct. Uh, why didn't we do this? What's, would somebody have an obvious intuition why we didn't do it? Sorry? Uh, e probably that, yes, but also just the sheer size. So one of the reasons, if you read the comments for, uh, for struct pit in the kernel, uh, it will give an explanation why it exists in the first place. And why it exists in the first place was basically, oh, uh, if we need, to, we need to keep a reference to, a stable reference to a process a lot of times, uh, and we want to recycle task struct because it's burning too much memory. It's, it's pretty big. If, if you look at the file, it's like there's massive amounts of inf information in there. And so that's why we used, uh, that's why we used uh, struct pit. Exactly. Um, so why did we do this in the first place? Stable private handle, why would you want this? Why aren't, uh, why aren't pits enough? Uh, I guess this is the burning first question. Uh, and why did we use FDs and not, for example, UUIDs, which some people suggested and so on? Um, so the issue, well, the main reason why we did is, uh, is pit recycling, which some people think is not really an issue. Um, so pit allocation instead of the kernel, oh, and by the way, if anyone knows more about something than I do, please yell as well. So uh, the way pit allocation in the kernel happens is uh, cyclically. So if you hit the maximum number of pits that you configured on your system, then it wraps around and finds the next free pit. So this way you can recycle, we can recycle pits, especially if you're in a system that is under a lot of pressure. So you, you uh, create a lot of processes that exit very fast and so on. Um, <coughs> And it shouldn't be an issue if you bump the number of, uh, um, of what the maximum size of a pit can be, can be very high, to four million and so on. Uh, but usually on a standard system, it's 32, about 32,000, which is fairly quick to uh, recycle. And it's also not a theoretical issue. If, if you look at, I linked a bunch of, uh, to a bunch of CVEs and problems. So the most well-known one is, I guess, um, this, yes, this is the one in Polkit. I think Jan might have found this. Um, so uh, you could 
win a race against Orchid uh, to recycle a bunch of processes so fast that you wrapped the PID uh, and then trick Polkit into authenticating you uh, with the wrong process. So this is an issue that, that, uh, that actually happens. Um, there is a, a bunch of PID-based Mac exploits, actually. This is something I found, which is pretty interesting. So they have issues with this as well. And as far as I know, I don't know the Apple source code, so this is a wild guess on my part. They don't have something like a, a process, uh, a stable handle on a process. Um, and there's a, there's a bunch more uh, issues uh, I linked to uh, that were discussed, another CDE as well. Um, another uh, reason was shared libraries, uh, so basically forking off invisible helper processes without having to rely on SickChild to get exit notifications for a given process. Um, this is especially relevant if you're a generic shared library, as some people call it, that have an event loop, uh, which has a bunch of callbacks, and some of those callbacks, for example, react to sick child, uh, sick child signals. So if they get one, they, they try to wait either generically on all processes, um, but they might end up reaping, reaping processes they don't really want it to reap, and also taking away <laughs> taking away that process from the other uh, callback in the, in the event loop that actually wanted to wait on those processes. So with PIDFDs, and hopefully uh, we can uh, get to this bit time-wise, um, will allow you to solve this issue eventually cleanly. They partially already do. And process management delegation, which requires a bit more work than what we have right now. Right now we just have sort of a skeleton for uh, process handling. Um, so hand up, ideally hand off a handle to a non-parent process, for example, for waiting and signaling safely. Um, I would like to at least uh, explore the possibility of making it possible that non-parent processes can wait on uh, can wait on a process. So if you hand off an, a pit of D to them, um, the way exactly how we would implement this is I haven't worked on this specifically, but it would be pretty cool if this would be possible. So, but it needs to be safe. And it probably would need to be a property that you specify at um, process creation time. So when you when you create the pit of D, you will see in a bit how we create pit of Ds. And the last reason is, and this is sort of my, um, I guess, defense against why we didn't use UUIDs, um, the ubiquity of FDs in user space. So we already have a lot of patterns in user space to deal with FDs. This includes, for example, passing out FD info from proc self, FD info, and then the FD. That's, that's generic code you can reuse. Uh, most user space programs that are related to any kind of uh, Linux -y, Unix -y system will know how to deal with FDs. So they will have an event loop usually where you can stuff, stuff in FDs in and listen for events. Um, they have code to receive and send FDs. Uh, so it's it's pretty easy. So it should be ideally it should be pretty easy to switch to using uh, to using PID of these, um, which was also uh, pretty important. Um, so does user space really care about this feature? I mean, this is a, a question that as a kernel engineer we ask ourselves quite a lot, right? So are we just doing this? Well, I would be fine with just doing my work for fun, obviously, but uh, it's also pretty cool if you can come up and say, oh, by the way, this is really a feature that people want and that people actually use. Um, and it's a feature that people actually use. Uh, I, so some people actually, some projects got in touch and were like, cool that this work exists. We've been trying to use it. Uh, Qt was one of the examples. Assistant U was one of the examples. Crew and uh, LMKD, definitely, because there were also people, Joel, is Joel around? Ah, Joel uh, Fernandez from Google was involved in part of this work as well. Um, and so Dbus, for example, has something that is called Connection Unix Process ID Handle, which is PID based right now, um, uh, which is used for authenticate, well, I'm not sure if it's used for, oh, it's used to track a remote peer. Um, and it's obviously vulnerable to PID races as well. And so they have at least an issue up where they discuss switching to PID of these uh, to get rid of this problem and reliably track uh, track peers. Um, Qt, uh, they were once involved in initial uh, version uh, of, uh, of the patch set a long while ago. I'll be mentioning this in a bit. Um, 
they want to fork off invisible helper process because they fall uh, under the category of uh, shared libraries that I've been mentioning, generic sh shared libraries that don't know what other processes, f what other uh, callbacks in the event loop will fork off helper processes. Um, and systemd uh, wants to use it for process management toto coelo, as far as I understand. Um, a specific issue they have up right now is to reliably kill processes when you don't have the freezer C group available. So if you have the freezer C group available, you just freeze the C group and then you kill all processes. Uh, and zombies can't do syscalls, so you're fine. But on systems where you don't have the freezer C group, uh, you want to reliably kill processes, so, uh, and you need to identify whether they're in the right C group. So what you can do is you can get a PID of D, uh, you can read the information in what C group that process is in, but because you ho you're holding NFD, which is a stable handle, um, uh, you can then reliably kill the process. So PID of D send signal makes it safe to kill, uh, kill out uh, processes reliably. Um, and Creu uh, has something that is called detect PID reuse. They do pre dump, which is, Adrian can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, they do a series of pre dumps when they, um, store all information of a process that they later on want to restore. And if you do multiple pre to, so for example, track memory changes over time for a process, you need to make sure that it's still the same process. So they have a function called detect pit reuse, uh, which uses the, pro I think, process starting time or something. It's, it, it's really not, it's really just a heuristic and it's not really reliable. Uh, and they want to switch to pit of these uh, for this as well, which will also uh, let them get rid of this problem. And LMKD, LMKD what I, uh, is, um, Android's low memory killer demon, uh, which uh, which wants to make use of pit of these to also avoid uh, pit recycling um, issues, and they are probably the ones who uh, profit uh, a lot uh, of this, since I'm assuming that they 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 are under memory pressure a lot, <laughs> and they fork off a bunch of processes. Uh, right. So prior art, uh, this is always important. Um, Obviously, this is completely my idea, and nobody had that idea before. Um, no, I'm joking. Um, this is this is obviously it's it's something that actually um, Alexa reminded me of. This is pretty obvious if you look at Linux itself. If you look at proc, the proc pit directory, proc itself already pins a process, right? So that's that's sort of why struct pit exists as well. So a proc pit directory, if you have an FD to it, it, it sort of it pins struct pit in the kernel already. You can't do anything with it, and it doesn't help you at all, but you know, the concept is there as well. Just staring at the code for a while, you could probably have figured this out. Um, but there are also other systems who, uh, who had similar ideas. Uh, my fault actually was, uh, which is uh, sort of the, the fault a lot of people have that are born later in time. Um, I naively assumed uh, for some systems that they had it when they didn't, so I didn't get my history right, basically. For example, I always assumed that Solaris had it, so Illumos, which is the open source alternative to it, um, but they don't. They actually just have a pure user space emulation of a process table handle. It's proc open, proc run, proc uh, close, proc free, which is vulnerable to all of the problems that I um, detailed at the beginning of the talk. Um, and OpenBSD and NetBSD also don't have it. Uh, I've looked at the, the kernel source code. Uh, there is no private stable process handles. They have references to it, they have references to it so it's, it's sometimes mentioned, but it, there is no implementation for it. Um, uh, FreeBSD has it. I guess that it, this is the, well, uh, the most well-known um, example. I think this derives back from the Capsicum pro uh, project why they implemented it. So they have something which is uh, not called PID of D. Obviously, on Linux, you always have to come up with your own name. Um, so they call it ProcDesk, um, a process file descriptor, I guess, and process descriptor. Uh, and they have three syscalls, PD fork, PD get PID, and uh, PD kill. And on Linux, we, we, sort, of have, we sort of have two of those. Uh, we have PD fork and, and uh, PD kill now. Or, but the semantics actually differ in a, in a bunch of aspects, and um, I, I can go into more detail if, if you really want to know about it. Um, but for now, it's sort of the concept is at least similar. The semantics are sometimes uh, are sometimes different. Like, for example, the way we uh, the way we on Linux deal with processes where we explicitly ignore. Uh, where we explicitly ignore a sick child, we auto-read the processes so they just go away. 
uh, you don't, uh, there is nothing fancy going on. What um, FreeBSD is actually is doing, it's reparenting it to init, and then uh, init gets a sick child, and so FreeBSD is, for example, saying, <laughs> pit one, <laughs> go deal with it. Um, uh, so this means that they, ha they have to do some things differently uh, the way we did it or intend to do it for future features on Linux. Um, and Linux had, uh, there were uh, multiple pushes to get a uh, concept of a private process stable handle uh, via an FD in. Uh, fork FD and clone FD. Clone FD might be one that is the most well known, which was sort of a collaboration between Qt, um, yes, uh, which came from a collaboration from Qt and uh, is it David Ristail? I don't want to lie right now. Um, but there is a patch set uh, for this out. You can Google for clone FD and you should see the patch set. And actually, even back in the day, I, th I guess uh, 2015, uh, people were very receptive to the idea, but the patch set itself tried to get it. Sorry, yeah? Like, uh, another piece of prior art is the work from Casey Darlin, I think it was in 2009, Wait FD, uh, which let you do wait, uh, a wait pit on file descriptors so you could poll things. Um, uh, um, huh. This also worked for thread directed sig um, uh, signals, such as you get from wait pid on key trace processes, which unfortunately it looks like th 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 this won't do because it's a per, per process thing only. It's a shame. C currently, yeah. yeah. There is, there is, there is technically to repeat, there, there is technically. There is actually a use case. So I'll, I'll do it a bit later. Yes, yes there, there are use cases. I originally thought, for example, for p-thread management or something, it would be really nice to have this, yes. So there is technically no reason not, uh, not to do it. Uh, I think when we started this work, I spoke to Florian Weimann and asked him, um, what do you think about making use of this for, uh, for p-thread? And he was like, mm, yeah, it sounds interesting, but also we need to be backwards compatible. So if they ever, for example, they are saying, this is a use case we have, please let's, let's get this done and we can think about it. It's really that, um, that Oleg Nesrov uh, uh, basically said, oh, if we do clone thread right now with PIDFDs, it gets really hairy. Uh, and are we really sure that we want to do this right now? Um, ah, okay. Um, right, so uh, this is prior art. Um, I can talk about clone FD. F so I tried to figure out why it, it, it didn't get merged. I think the reason is, uh, it tried to do many things uh, at the same time in one patch set, so, which is understandable, right? It's usually you have a really cool idea and you think, uh, these are all the features that we can build on top of it. Here is a patch set that makes all of them uh, available at the same time, and this is usually not an approach that flies very well on, on Linux, which is also fine because, you know, y if you merge it and then you have to route it through a tree and then you have to be responsible for it, somebody needs to maintain it and it's not guaranteed that the people are staying around and so on, so doing it, uh, in a sort of more piecemeal, piecemeal fashion is usually the better, uh, the better approach. But um, the idea was uh, the idea was s was similar, but it also mixed auto reaping semantics, um, so that the process just exits uh, and goes away, and nobody has to wait on it uh, with FDs and so on. So it, it wasn't it wasn't clear cut, I think, uh, as it should have been. So this really didn't uh, this really didn't land, right? So what did we do? Uh, well, we tried to build a new API. Uh, and so far, this work is spanning for kernel releases. And actually, this sounds like um, this has been a massive amount of code. <laughs> and we've, uh, we've changed many, many things. Actually, we, we didn't. So like the, the, the actual changes that we needed uh, in the kernel are not that huge. Uh, it's, it's just that I sort of wanted to choose a being the one who sort of tried to guide this a little, there were a lot more people involved in the discussion and design, so this is obviously not my, uh, my personal achievement. Um, uh, it was just I wanted to have a sustainable speed uh, so that we could be sure that the things we are doing uh, are correct and also that we have time to react to bugs. So if you have to do, you, you push new features at the same time uh, and a lot of features at the same time. If things break, you you know it might break in, in a bunch of places at the same time, and so on. If you do it piecemeal over a couple of kernels, you have time to catch design mistakes also. And yeah, um, building a new API. A comment I would like to make that I this is the first time I actually speak about this. So lucky you or not um, is 
the pit of the API was, in my imagination at least, and people who are involved in this work, um, uh, like Joel and a bunch of other Google guys, uh, might disagree with this. Um, my intention was never uh, to sort of say pit of D is replacing uh, the pit API uh, completely. I always thought of it, it's an alternative way of managing processes that is probably uh, very useful to you if you need to be very, very sure that the process you're operating on is actually the process that you're, <laughs> that you're operating on and also that there is a connection between the PID API and the PID FD API so that you sort of, you can choose uh, one, you don't necessarily have to choose either I'm making PID FD, I'm doing PID FDs or I'm doing PIDs, but you, you can use both at the same time. Now, that has limits obviously, but uh, the way we designed it actually, and you will see this at the clone when we talk about the clone PID FD flag, there is a nice uh, interaction uh, between, between the two of them. So the PID FD API is not, uh, PIDs are, uh, pits are a completely wrong concept, don't use them anymore. Uh, it just, here's, a, here's a new way of doing process management. Sure, um, I expect that there will be new features in the future that will be based on PID FDs that you can based on PIDs by virtue of how they are, uh, how they are implemented, um, but, but that should be about it. Right, so one of the first things we did in, in kernel 5.1 uh, was PID FD send signals. So a way to send signals through um, PID of these. Uh, you could argue that we started the wrong, the wrong way around, so we didn't uh, implement something that lets you create a PID of D right away. Uh, we started off with a syscall that operates on a, on a PID of D. The reason for this is um, that it's, it's the most obvious thing that user space wants or would ask for, reliably sending signals, especially if you think about any time of, uh, type of process management, this is what you want. You, you don't want to be end up in a situation where you accidentally send a signal to a wrong process, especially if you're talking about uh, sick kernel. So it was very easy to make the case for a PID of D, uh, send signal. Um, yes, so uh, there's a bunch of, here we get into a, a tricky area to some extent. Um, people had a, it also meant, be, it being the obvious piece that you really, really want, it also meant that people had a lot of opinions, which is fine. Uh, but everybody, everybody push, pushed in a different direction because everybody had, had, different, uh, had different needs. Uh, some people just wanted a PDFD to be a very abstract handle, myself included. Other people wanted to have, wanted to, wanted to correspond to a proc PID directory so that they could get easy metadata access, um, which then proved to be really uh, difficult in terms of security when you think about creating a process uh, from the clone syscall and so on. So there was a lot of back and forth going on and long, long, uh, long, long email threads um, about this. Uh, but uh, we finally, we finally, um, we came to a sort of compromise, I think. So with PID of descent signal, you can use a shortcut. You can open a process proc PID directory and use the FD that you get from it, which already is in kernel a stable handle as it pins a struct PID. Uh, and you can pass this to PID of descent signal and then send, um, send signals to, uh, to processes. Uh, this is a very nice shortcut for user space. Actually, they like it a lot. I don't like it from the perspective of I would have liked an API that is very, very consistent and you don't have two different types of FDs that your API is dealing with, but it's only the syscall and actually there is precedent in the kernel. Like for example, the new mount API will likely gain a FS info syscall and the FS info syscall will operate on regular FDs that you get from directories and so on that are mount points, um, but also on FDs that are returned from the new mount API syscall such as FS pick or FS open, which are a total different type. Um, so we, we have precedence of this in the kernel, so I don't think it's that bad. Um, PID FD send signal currently does the job of uh, kill, positive PID, and then the signal. So um, it's you currently, there is no way we can, we can uh, enable this later. There's currently no way to say, I want, this, I want to signal this specific thread. Uh, it's always a random thread in the thread group that wants the signal so that it doesn't have it blocked and, and so on. This is exactly how kill operates today. Also, um, we don't allow, um, we don't allow you to signal, 
a pit of deed that you don't, that lives in a pit name space that is not, of which you are not an ancestor pit name space because they are hierarchical. Um, yes, um, so you can signal upwards. If you, if you somehow get access to a pit of deed from a different pit, pit name space that is either a sibling pit name space or uh, is an ancestor pit name space, you can signal upwards and you can uh, signal uh, horizontally. There is. There might be use cases for this in the future where you can do this, where you can signal between different, uh, send signals between different pit, pit name spaces via PIDFDs. But again, there was no use case for it, so we didn't see a reason to, to come up with complicated semantics right away. Um, but again, there is nothing that prevents us from doing this, uh, doing this in the future. Um, Eric actually was in favor of this, but uh, yeah, just didn't have a use case. Um, and then in 5.2, uh, we landed probably, uh, it's not the most important bit, but it's, uh, I, I like that piece of code uh, specifically. Oh, and by the way, I should say, that I, talk, I talked about code size. The syscall is really small. It lives in kernel flash signal.c, and if you look at the patch, it's really not, it's, really, it's not a, a complicated syscall, um, and uh, it's, it's not a lot of code, so. Uh, clone pit of D. Uh, so the idea was you want to be able to create processes at creation time, and here we ran into another uh, challenge. Uh, we ran into the same challenge we had with pit of D send signals. What type of file descriptor are we going to make this? And at first it was like, for consistency, please make it, um, uh, Linus had opinions about this, uh, I think, uh, make it a proc, make clone a pit of D return return a proc pid, uh, an FD to the proc pid directory of the process. And then um, uh, Jan and I teamed up um, and implemented two different solutions because we, we, we thought it wouldn't be feasible to do it uh, as file descriptors to proc pid directories of the process. Be because of security reasons, it would have meant to rework proc to make it more safe because there are like for example, proc pit net contains a bunch of information that is not where you can snoop on networking information of other processes, so we would have found needed a way to restrict access to this to be able to safely send around these uh, these file descriptors and so on. So it was all, and the code was really complicated to get right. Um, uh, the patch set is still on LKML because we sent out two RFCs at the same time, one for the approach that we went with and one for the proc pit approach. And the proc pit approach, even just the code, even though we tried to make it very as elegant as possible, it's really ugly. Um, uh, it's also because of how proc works and so on. And it, I'm pretty happy that we ended up with what we ended up with. So uh, what we did is, as you can see, we used uh, anon inodes, uh, anonymous inodes. Um, does everybody know what this is? Okay, so I can, a brief explanation. It's basically um, just a single inode uh, in the kernel. Uh, it's a small little subsystem. Um, uh, and this inode is uh, shared between all uh, file descriptors, uh, right? So you have a timer FD. This is used by timer FDs, by signal FDs, by BPF uses it as well. I guess the new mount API use it as well. So they don't really require a full inode. You don't need to allocate a new inode all of the time and then when all references to the inode are dropped, you, you destroy it and so on. It's just, it, the inode just functions to hang on a bunch of file operations on there. That's all you need it for. Um, so it's a really cheap way of creating a stable, uh, a stable handle. And the other nice thing is all of the infrastructure is already there. We don't need to come up with a separate tiny little file systems for pit of Ds and so on, but all of the infrastructure is there. That's, that's the code, that's the core code. There is more changes to this, but that's the core code in fork.c that creates a pit of D. You specify a flag um, at process creation time, and then you allocate a new file. You stash a reference to, uh, you stash a reference to struct pit of the process you just created in there, and then you have a stable process handle. You return that, uh, you return that um, FD. Uh, so we stole uh, the last uh, the last usable um, flag for this uh, from clone. So if when clone pit of D landed, clone was saturated. Um, there are a bunch of flags that are unused that the kernel currently ignores, but we can't safely reuse them because I looked at started looking at user space uh, and glibc and muscle. That's the way you pronounce it, right? Muscle, useful muscle. Um, and uh, they, for example, pa they still pass clone detached 
down. And the clone detach flag has been, has been ignored, I think, since kernel 2.6 something or something. But it means if I then were go on, someone were to decide, like, let's uh, recycle the clone detach flag because nobody should be using this anymore in user space, then, well, two libcs are broken. Um, so that's, that wasn't going to fly. So uh, out of clone flags, uh, we've solved that problem later. We have a new clone version. Um, another specialty about, I guess, PIDFDs is, uh, which I tried to push for also for the new mount API, but that wasn't super well received, is that they are cloexec by default. But especially for PIDFDs, I guess it makes sense. You really don't want to leak PIDFDs into, uh, into a child process. Um, so, yeah, as you can see, they're cloexec by default. Um, which, in my ideal world, every new file descriptor type that we create uh, should be cloexec by default, because you can use, uh, wha what we decide, how is func FCN control? Functl, okay. Let's go with functl. You can take functl and take, uh, take away the cloexec flag. Um, to do it race-free the other way around is a bit, more, a bit more difficult. But there are certain fractions in the kernel that think that's not a great idea because then we end up with uh, some file descriptors that have uh, o cloexec by default and some file descriptors that are not. But actually, even before the PIDFD uh, change landed, this was already the case for, for example, for the second notifier FD which is a new file descriptor type that you can get from seccomp is cloexec by default as well, so that ship had already sailed. But yes, if you have, if you think about adding a new file descriptor type, it would be, I, I would uh, strongly urge you to consider it to make it cloexec by default because user space will really, uh, really thank you for doing that. And also, uh, we wanted to have a connection. So there are two ways where the PIDFD API and the PID, PID API are connected here. So if you specify clone PIDFD, the original implementation that we had and that also the original clone FD um, patch that had last I looked at it, um, was that if you specified the flag, then you didn't, clone didn't return a PID, but it returned you NFD. So basically you did type switching based on a flag, which is not very nice, but this was the first implementation that, uh, that we had. Um, it also meant that you couldn't return uh, zero, right? For file descriptor, zero is a perfectly fine value if standard in is closed. Um, but obviously, uh, zero as a return value is used uh, to indicate that this is the child process right now and not the parent process. So we would have, uh, we could not have allocated file descriptors uh, starting from zero, which again is not very nice. So um, Oleg suggested how, how at least for clone, we abuse, uh, we abuse the parent tit pointer argument. Um, TID pointer argument, uh, which is already used as a return argument, uh, only for clone parent set TID and for legacy clone make it uh, make it uh, incompatible with clone PIDFD. So what we what you get right now, even with legacy clone, is you you get a PID back normal behavior, but you also get a PIDFD placed in the parent TID pointer uh, pointer argument. So you see. There is no, there is not additional effort needed for you to find out what the PID is for that uh, for that PIDFD, which is again different to FreeBSD. You have PD fork, it gives you a proc desk uh, back, and then you need <coughs> PD get PID. I think uh, another system call that gives you the that gives you the, the PIDFD back, <coughs> uh, gives you the PID back for the uh, proc file descriptor that you use. For us, it's both at the same time, PID and uh, PIDFD, which is nice. So you can choose what you're operating on. Probably if you don't want to pit of these, you wouldn't have specified clone pit of D, but yeah. And also, um, if you have a pit of D, uh, but you don't have a pit and you want to you want to learn what this uh, pit of D, what pit this pit of D is referring to, we have uh, proc pit FD FD info, and FD FD info will uh, currently give you uh, the pit number uh, for in the pit namespace of the proc instance you're looking at. So if you, you can parse out the PID, um, to, there's an uh, alternative way of doing this. Right, so this is obviously now you can, in a race-free way, create PID of these at process creation time. Well, but with the new clone system call that I added, clone three, you also have a dedicated return argument in, in it's now a structure, uh, which gives you back the, um, the PID of these, so it, it's, ha it's cleaner. Uh, also, we're not out of flags. <coughs> Um, this is work that has been done uh, by Joel. This is something that um, 
that we discussed early on is also had some controversy uh, associated, uh, associated with it because we have different requirements and different ideas of what we want from this. But basically right now, <coughs> if you have a PIDFD, I'm sorry, if you have a PIDFD, uh, you can get exit notifications uh, even as a non-parent process. You don't get the exit status currently, but you at least get notified that process has exited. Well, technically, to be very precise, you get notified when um, the threat group leader exits and the threat group is empty. Well, it should never be the case. That, that's, a, that's a bug that, there was actually a bug where you could have a, a zombie threat group leader, but threats that were still alive, which shouldn't happen because now you have a problem that you can't send signals to a zombie threat group leader, so find all of the threats and kill them one by one. But yes, so when the threat group leader exits and the threat group is empty, you get notified that uh, this process is um, now gone, which means uh, for a shared library, you can now turn off, if you use PIDFDs, you can now turn off sick child. Um, say, I don't want the signal when that process exits because I have a PIDFD and it's in an epoll uh, e loop and I just want to be notified over the PIDFD, uh, not via sick child. Uh, which made a lot of people very happy, apparently. Um, so you can hand off these PIDFDs, stuff it in epoly loops, and then watch for, uh, watch for process uh, exits. This is also, again, this is the code. It looks in two different files, but I compacted it together. Um, PIDFD poll lives in fork.c, uh, because it's a file method, and do notify PIDFD lives in don't let me lie signal.c. Oh, yes. Um, uh, so when a process exits uh, and do notify parent is called, it calls do notify PIDFD. And if you have been watching closely, you see that in struct PID there is uh, hlist head task, no, nonsense. Wait Q head T wait PIDFD. So uh, struct PID, uh, everyone gets notified that has a reference to struct PID via such a PIDFD. Okay, and that's obviously that's a that's a pretty interesting uh, it's a pretty interesting piece of work. Um, it's not as advanced as what FreeBSD has to uh, to draw comparisons. Um, FreeBSD has KQ and they they also can get notifications such as um, the exit status uh, for non-parent processes via uh, via KQ uh, because KQ in contrast to APOL gives you information back from the kernel, so you can just stuff uh, uh, stuff put stuff in the, uh, in as we do with Apple, you can put stuff from user space in there and if you get a notification on DFD, you get it back from the kernel, so you stuff your own information there. KQ also gives you back information from, uh, the, that the kernel places in there, especially for uh, proc file descriptors. And then you can watch, you can also watch uh, when one of these proc file descriptors uh, forks or XX and so on, that's pretty nice. Maybe in s at some point in the future we can have something similar, but since we don't have KQ and EPOL can give you back data from the kernel, at least not as far as I know, um, there is currently no nice way to do this and we didn't want to implement read uh, on PIDFDs at this point uh, at this point in time. Um, Jan was against this as well for security reasons and so on. So currently, if you're a non-parent, you cannot, uh, well, you can read PROC, obviously, to get the exit status, but there is no easy way to read it off of the PIDFD. But yeah, you can probably find ways to do this. Um, and also in 5.3 is PIDFDs without clone PIDFDs. So um, this came especially from, from uh, the LMKD uh, uh, guys uh, at Android, and also uh, systemd had a use case for this. So if you fork the process and you wanted to get a pollable pit of D uh, for uh, for them, then you uh, can you couldn't do this. But with pit of D open, you can. You specify uh, you specify the pit, and uh, then you get a pit of D for it, which is uh, pollable pollable as well. Um, and for 5.4, this is sort of the last uh, the last pit for the for the skeleton, more or less, um, is waiting. This is proposed, so it's been it's been uh, sent to Linus. I don't know if he's going to take it. Maybe he won't. Uh, but it's up for the 5.4 uh, merge window. Is waiting through pit of these. We had a bit of a discussion how we exactly wanted to implement this. The most obvious way 
uh, to a lot of people seemed to add a new type to the weight ID system called PPDFD, uh, which, yes, which you can specify, you can specify a PDFD and then you can wait on it. Uh, so that's, the, that's sort of the, the core API that we have right now. Um, the idea is, there is a bunch of ideas that, uh, that I still have, that I have started working on, um, but haven't fully, I'm not fully sure about what semantics uh, I want. Like for one of the things, for example, that I like, and that a lot of user space projects also like, is uh, the kill on close semantics that uh, uh, FreeBSD has by default. So if you close the PID of D and it's the last FD that refers to the struct file that stashes away um, struct PID, then uh, the process automatically gets, uh, gets sick killed. Um, we, we have it the other way around. And do, if you want to keep the process alive, even when the last PID of D has been closed, on FreeBSD, you need to spe specify a special flag called PDEM and PDDEM, I think. Um, for us, it's the default. The process stays alive even if you specify, uh, even if the last PID of D is closed. Um, but uh, there is, uh, we could implement a flag uh, at process creation time uh, that lets you kill a process when the last FD referring to it is closed. The problem is that on FreeBSD, cleaning up, uh, struct, st cleaning up struct files, basically the release method that is called when a file is destroyed is called synchronously. So by the time close returns on FreeBSD, you are sure that the release method has run. On Linux, we have a work queue. So if you close an FD and, uh, the re and close returns, and it's the last FD, the release method might not necessarily have been called because it's been added to work queue. The kernel might decide, ah, I'm gonna do this a little bit later because, you know, memory pressure or whatever. So it's asynchronously and it's kind of, I'm kind of on the fence whether that still makes it a good idea, um, makes it a good idea uh, or not. But I think I'm getting, slowly get, uh, running out of time. So I hope I could give you an overview of uh, the API we sort of uh, built. Um, and uh, hopefully convince you of its usefulness and uh, a little bit of glimpse into the future. There's, there's one more thing um, that we would need to make the shared library case uh, completely, uh, completely uh, usable. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy that we have this right now. And if you have any questions, Also, if, if, excuse me, if Jerome's here, could you please start hooking up? Oh, yes, I can also unplug. Thank you. Wait, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Uh, have you given any thought about uh, integrating with C groups, like uh, C group two, C group dot prox? Uh, yeah, C group dot prox. Mm, no. What exactly would be your uh, uh, your idea? Uh, well, when you open cgroup.prox, it gives you um, a list of file descriptors, right? Or PIDs, right? Right. Uh, and between the time you do something with those PIDs and you opened it, it could have changed, right? You could, uh, ah, ah, we, I think we had, uh, we had a discussion about, uh, do we have this discussion about it? A flag where you can kill per cgroup or something? Uh, there are certainly ways where we can think about this, uh, where you can make it so that you could take down a whole C group, for example. But so far, I haven't thought about this. But yeah, there are so many, to be honest, there are so many possibilities that you could go with, that you could do, that it's kind of sometimes hard to be, uh, to stay calm about this. Um, but I don't want to rush, but I don't want to rush things. But we're always open for patches, like the pit of D stuff has its own tree. Um, so, yeah. Uh, one thing I would really like uh, is, I want to make it so, and I try to make it so, is um, often on Linux at process creation, if you create a process with a specific pro uh, with a specific property, you then can later on use a PR cattle or some other syscall to change this property, to switch it on or switch it off, which is something that I don't really like, especially if you, if you think about process delegation, process management delegation, you really want that property to pre it at process creation time, and that process sticks with this process until it goes away. Um, and that's something that I would really like. So basically treat it like a, almost like a capability on a file descriptor. Um, 
th that would be that would be something I would really like to see more. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so, do I understand correctly that PDF is prevent feed recycling? Yes. The, the recycling of the feed. Uh, okay. Uh, oh. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, I should be very clear. I didn't mention this. Oh, this was a totally snafu on my part. Um, so the, the pit can be recycled itself. So it doesn't pin the pit. It's not like, I think, on Windows where the, where the pit just stays around. It guarantees you that when the process is exited, and for example, you send a signal to it, you say, kill this process, but the process has already been gone, uh, then the kernel will tell you ESArch, which is uh, Erno for uh, there is no such process. It, it has gone. Um, so that, that pit of D is a stable handle in the sense you can't be tricked into operating on a process that doesn't exist anymore. But the pit itself can be recycled. But that means that, for example, to check the C group, I, um, I need to open the PDFD, check the C group, and check if the PDFD is still valid? Is yes, there is code, there is a sample, uh, there is a sample program, uh, exactly for that reason, because I knew that it came up, there is a, a sample program in uh, a directory in the samples directory slash pitfd something something that shows you how to, in a race-free manner, turn uh, an, an anonymous inode pitfd into a proc pit directory. It basically involves parsing out uh, the proc pit fd info, the pit from that file, and then opening that file and then sending a signal and checking whether it's still the same process. So it's, it's really in there. You can see how this can be done in a race-free manner. We exactly thought about this. Okay, case. I'm sorry to interrupt, oh, but uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much. Let's thank the speaker and let's welcome our next speaker.